In this video we're going to start looking at how we can combat raised intracranial pressure. This is quite a big topic so I'm going to break it down into a few short videos rather than one giant one. Today we're going to focus on how reducing the volume of blood inside the skull can help to reduce pressure. I've already made a video on ICP dynamics where I went into more detail about how raised pressures inside the brain come about. If you're new to the subject you might want to have a look at this video first. I'll put a link down in the description below. If not, for the rest of us, let's do a quick recap. There are three main components inside the skull, the brain, the CSF and the blood. If any one of these components increases in volume, then intracranial pressure will increase. If any one of these three components decreases in volume, then ICP will be reduced. The cause of the raised intracranial pressure could well be the buildup of blood itself. For example, after brain trauma, there is often bleeding in the space between the brain and the skull, which can lead to a fatal buildup of pressure if not treated. In this scenario, a surgeon will need to drill a hole through the skull to drain away the buildup of blood. This is known as a burr hole procedure. This will reduce ICP inside the skull and hopefully save a life. But what if the cause of the increased pressure is a swollen brain? Reducing the volume of blood can still be an effective strategy, but we can't simply drain it away from the body. In the very short term, this would reduce pressures, but the patient would quickly become anemic, leading to a whole host of new problems. So how can we reduce the volume of blood inside the skull without removing the blood from the body entirely? This is Tim. Hello, Tim. If we were to take Tim and we were to hold him upside down, then gravity is going to naturally want to push his blood down in the direction of his skull. The heart and the rest of the cardiovascular system is going to have to work against gravity as it pushes blood out of the brain. The volume of blood inside the brain will therefore slightly increase, leading to an increased intracranial pressure. However, if we sit a patient up, the opposite happens. This time, gravity is our friend, working with the heart rather than against it. Drainage of the blood from the skull is improved, reducing the volume of blood and therefore the pressure. For the same reason, we should aim to keep the neck straight and the head facing forward, so as not to twist and obstruct the veins draining blood from the brain. Patient positioning can be an effective method for reducing intracranial pressure, as well as being low cost and low impact for the patient. Tim is busy exercising to help us demonstrate an important point. As he makes his body work harder, his cells have to break down more oxygen for energy. The harder Tim works, the quicker his cells will work through the available oxygen. Breaking down all of this O2 into energy will produce ever greater quantities of carbon dioxide, which will be drawn out of the cells and into the blood vessels. The blood vessels interpret this rise in CO2 as a sign that the cells are working harder and dilate in response. These dilated blood vessels are capable of bringing greater quantities of oxygen and nutrients to the tissue to meet the increased demands. CO2 is therefore a potent vasodilator. Blood vessels in the brain are also affected by CO2. In the presence of high levels of carbon dioxide, they dilate, letting more blood into the brain. This increased volume of blood will lead to increased intracranial pressures. Of course, if increased levels of CO2 lead to the dilation of blood vessels, then the opposite must also be true. Blood vessels respond to lower levels of carbon dioxide by constricting. With ventilated patients, we can use this effect to our advantage when attempting to reduce pressures in the brain. Using the ventilator, we can reduce CO2 levels in the bloodstream, promoting vasoconstriction. These constricted blood vessels carry a small, smaller volume of blood and ICP is reduced. CO2 management can be a very effective method for controlling raised intracranial pressures, but it's not without its risks. Overworking a patient's lungs with the ventilator in order to drive down CO2 can risk damaging them, potentially seriously. Overconstricting blood vessels is also hazardous. If we reduce CO2 levels too much, then the blood vessels may become too constricted to supply adequate quantities of oxygen and nutrients to the brain, leading to damage. It is of course no good reducing pressures in the brain just to damage it by another means. A balance must be struck between reducing the volume of blood in the brain and allowing a healthy level of circulation to occur. When manipulating CO2 levels for ICP control, it is best to aim for the lower end of the normal range for carbon dioxide. A normal range for CO2 from an arterial blood gas is between 4.5 to 6 kilopascals. Aiming for a CO2 of between 4.5 to 5 kilopascals 
will help to promote vasoconstriction within the brain without causing unintended consequences. If you found this video useful, please click like below and leave a comment. It helps other people to find the information.